I want you to remember what we proved last time. What did we prove last time? We looked at three derivatives. We said for all of the um, all of the basic trig functions, right? The three basic ones, and really they're down to one basic one. The derivatives actually are very, very simple. In fact, there's a really nice symmetry to it. So we started off with sine, and we found its derivative was cosine, cosine right? So I'm going to write cos. Yeah. Um, we then said, well, okay, obvious next question. How about cosine? And we found it. It didn't take you directly back. It took you to negative sign, right? And then the last one, we used quotient rule, we found that it also came out quite nice and simple. It's set square, right? So that's nice and neat, okay? Obviously, even though we're gonna get to it a bit later, each of these statements, which is a derivative, will give you a statement about an integral, right? And we will get more to the integration up later this week. But I just want to have these back in our minds. I guess as well, following on from this, not that you necessarily need to have it written down because I think the concept now that we're so familiar with it hopefully doesn't require an extra proof. But if I were to convert all of these into chain rule, right? So if I had not just sine x, but sine of some function, right? What would happen there? What would happen when we differentiate? What does, some, uh, what does chain rule tell you? You do the inside, you do the outside, right? So the inside is f. So its derivative will be f dash, right? and then sine turns into cosine. So this is what chain rule looks like for sine. Right? And in exactly the same way, uh, what does chain rule look like for cosine? You're going to do the inside, becomes f dash. You do the outside, turns into minus sine. So I'll put the minus way out the front. Then you turn into sine, like so. And of course, just to complete it, tan. F dash, and then of course the tan part of it turns into sec squared. When students differentiate these and get these results, um, common errors include writing the f dash and then doing sec squared and then thinking, oh yeah, I know exactly what it looks like and forgetting there's a whole extra function in there. Um, leaving off the minus sign or reversing the minus sign, another common error. These are, at least all these basic results, they're all on your reference sheet. There's no excuses, okay? Um, I don't think you should be referring to that because you guys will use them a lot. Um, but there's no reason to be able to say, wait, I should just check this. When I'm going through my paper and double checking and making sure I've made no silly mistakes, I should just refer to this glance at it one more time. Okay? So, now we can differentiate trig functions. Hooray! There are four main applications of being able to do this. Like, this is a theory. There are four main areas that that's used in. Okay? What was the very first thing that we started doing? This very first kind of problem we started solving. When we first started differentiating full stop, not tree functions, just like polynomials. What did we do with them? Yeah. Ooh, we got to areas under curves. We had to take a while to get there. We had to go past differentiating though. We had to get to integration to do areas under curves, right? So that is an application, but it's an application of um, the other side of this. If I remember, like, yeah, derivatives are our gradient, right? So the main thing we used them to, with at the beginning was to find tangents and normals. Because tangents and normals are all about, oh, okay, well, you need to know the gradient of something to find what the tangent will be. So that's the first place we're going to begin. That's the first kind of question you'll encounter in 14H. It then goes on from there. We're going to have a look at a series of compound functions. Um, by which I mean, you've got functions and they introduce a sine or a cosine into it. Okay. As an example, <laughs> some people get really upset by trees. Um, as an example, um, a classic one is e to the x cos x. Now, you're actually going to encounter this question in the exercise shortly. I want you to think about what this does. e to the x, if you just saw e to the x, what's that graph? That's the exponential, whoosh, off it goes, right? So it's describing anything that is growing and growing and growing, and it grows faster the bigger it is, okay? 
Now, what difference does this make? What does this add into this? Hmm. Now, what's happening is it's going up and down, and up and down, and up and down. And at the same time, it's growing and growing and growing and growing. Right? So this, what we call it, it has this oscillating behavior, whereas this has this growth behavior. Okay? Oscillating growth. Right? So it's going up and down, but it's getting bigger and bigger, and it's stretching out. Okay? So if you have what we call you know, a positive feedback loop, and something is getting bigger, and it's affecting itself, and getting, its effects are getting greater, okay? this is the kind of thing you get. If you have a look at something like this, think about this for a second. What have I changed? Instead of getting bigger and bigger and bigger, this is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, this is a situation which we call damping, right? That you've got something that's going back and forth, damping, right? Um, but the effects are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So for example, if um, every stringed instrument, every stringed instrument in the world, when you strike it, it starts to oscillate. It goes up and down and up and down. But then if you just leave it, just by the nature of tension in the string and air resistance, it'll gradually slow down until it stops. Okay? And that's exactly what this picture is doing. Now, these are compound functions, but they involve the trig functions in them to give that sort of up-down behavior. So in order to be able to deal with them, we needed all of these. So that's a classic application. Okay? Um, last two, rate of change. We've looked at rates of change before. We're like, oh, okay, something is getting bigger or smaller, something's being poured in or something's being drained out. If you have something and it's changing based on some kind of angle, okay. So, for example, you've got a, um, you know, say, you've got a, a a lighthouse and it's shining a light on a certain area, okay. Well, what's changing in that situation is the lighthouse is changing its angle, okay. There's a rate of change associated with some kind of distance out there that matches to that angle. And obviously, trig is going to be involved because angles are involved. So anything where there's a rate of change involving something like that, uh, a triangle that's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger because its angle is getting larger, all of those require us to be able to differentiate these guys and find out, oh, where's the stationary point? Where's all of the, um, for the next thing, which is the last kind, where's the maximum or the minimum, right? Um, for example, here's actually a classic question. Let's take that lighthouse example. Suppose there was a lighthouse standing right here, okay, and it was shining a light at the walls of this classroom. Okay? You can imagine, if I shine right at the back there, or right at the sides, okay? in other words, so that the beam of light is a normal to the wall. Okay? And if it's just a normal light, what shape will be traced out? It's just going to be a circle. Right? But if I go to, like, say, the corner, okay, you're not going to get a circle if I shine at the corner, are you? What's going to happen to the shape of the light? Here's the room, right? Here's like my um, here's my light source. Okay, and if I go directly across, oh, okay, but you guys can see this, right? If you start to go this way, right, your light beam is sort of doing this. It's stretching out. Okay. So the question is, and this you don't really need to think about this as a, an area problem. It's really just about width, because that's what's changing. Where's the maximum width of the light? Where does that take place? Because eventually you hit a wall. And then it starts to get smaller and smaller and smaller. Again. What is the actual width? So this is a classic maximum problem. This actually particular one is very, very hard. But it's just the first example I thought of because I was thinking about lighthouses. Okay? So any place where you've got angles and they're changing, you'll have a triangle or a cylinder or a cone or any, anything like that, and it's getting bigger, it's getting smaller. And just like we solved maximum problems before, now that you can differentiate these guys, you can find stationary points, you can determine their nature, do everything you could before, with trig functions involved. Does that make sense?